Um, every weekend, my wife and I have been going somewhere, you know, around us and close by um, to kind of just visit. We've been really squeezing the life out of summer before school started. So we got to go to Stenson Beach. We went to Emerald Bay last weekend and Tahoe. And we've been hitting all these places. And it's been, whoops, whoops, no problem. That's okay. We've been hitting all these places and all these microphones. And... Uh, and it's been a real, it's been just a lot of fun and a, and a real joy. And preparing for this week's message, I was telling my wife, you know, honey, we need to go to Napa Valley and sample some of the goods out there because I'm preaching on, you know, the vineyard come Sunday. And she said, well, we can't, you know, it's the kids are going back to school. And I was trying, you know, well, maybe we, you know, we, we, we got to consider the Lord, honey. You know, no, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't pushing. But uh, I said, you know, I want to get to Napa. I want to see the, the hills. I want to see uh, the farms, the vineyards. Um, this passage is probably a familiar passage to, to some of you. It's a passage from Isaiah that speaks of the Lord's provision. What God has provided... And what the people neglected to see. What God gave and yet what the people neglected to receive. It's called the Song of the Unfruitful Vineyard. Now vineyards in ancient Israel, they were big enterprises. Vineyards are a lot of work. If you know anything about vineyard and cultivating land. In the ancient world, you'd have to not only just cultivate the land, you'd have to uh, create a gate, create a, gar uh, 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 a wall around the area so that people wouldn't come in and steal your grapes. This was a valuable, valuable product. There would actually, they would actually build towers and have people uh, in the towers watching and, and, and looking over the area. Uh, it was just a lot of work. A lot of work, a lot of work went into this. And so when, when God through the prophet Isaiah speaks of the vineyard, the vineyard he had created, it's stressing the, uh, the work of God. The, the, the lengths to which God is willing to go in order to provide for the people. It's stressing the lengths to which God is willing to go to provide for the people. So we have to have that in the back of our mind as we're thinking about this passage. Lest we're like, oh, it's just a vineyard, a vineyard, you plant, put a little seed in the ground, the vineyard, fine, comes right. No. If anybody knows about growing grapes, it's not that easy. And particularly in the ancient world, it's not easy. Something else we have to pay attention to is that in the ancient world, when there was a poem that was celebrating something that had to do with viniculture or gardening or wine, it was often called love poetry. It was kind of like, you know, in our culture today, if you hear like some little Marvin Gaye on, a little saxophone in the background, you know, uh-oh, we're getting that romantic atmosphere. You go into a restaurant and they're playing. There's certain tones, right? I'm not going to sing it for you, don't worry. <laughs> I won't embarrass myself, right? But you start hearing the tones, what are you hearing? Ooh, la la, romance, relax, right? Are you with me? Well, the same thing here. People in this culture, if they were hearing this, they would have been thinking, Romance. Why? Because it's using language uh, taken from, the, from romantic literature of the ancient Near East. That's important to understand because God is not only saying, I've worked really hard in blessing you, but he's also saying, and it's been a real joy to do it because I love you. I love you. It's not just God is really wanting to bless the people, but he's wanting to bless the people because he deeply loves them. That's what we have to kind of see as we begin to kind of think about this passage that's been put before us this morning. This is, this is a poem not only of grace, but of love. It's a poem not only of blessing, but of covenantal relationship that is being expressed towards the people. In verse 1, it says, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning the vineyard. Let me sing. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. This is a poem of God's love for his people. God has provided. He's made promises. He's been their helper. He's been their protector. He set up a system of worship whereby they could approach God and worship God. And what was the result? What was the result of this vineyard that God made? The blessings that God gave to his people. What was the result? When we read the, 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 the song, we would be arrested. If we hear this in Isaiah's poetic tones, 
we'd be thinking, wow, all the blessings, God, yes. And you've worked so hard. You've done so much. And it's all come from love. And it's all come. And all of a sudden, Isaiah begins to, the poem begins to turn and says, but the people didn't respond. But the people didn't reciprocate. And therefore, the heart of God broke. And God brought down judgment. God brought down judgment. That's a, that's a popular word, right? In churches, judgment, right? Fire and brimstone. Well, I'm not going to go there, but I want you to, I want to at least talk to you about this. Because in verse 5 it says, And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedges, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. Yikes. What happened to the love? What, what happened to the, the tender care and the grace? What's going on here? Isaiah, his understanding, his theology seems to be this. If you fail to respond to God's goodness, God will curse you. Seems to be what Isaiah is getting at here, what he's saying. Let me ask you a question. Does God really give us grace and blessing, but turn around and punish us if we don't avail ourselves of these things? If he does, doesn't that mean it wasn't really grace to begin with? Because isn't grace by definition something good that's given to us regardless of our works and responses? So what's going on, what's going on here, Isaiah? What are you saying, Isaiah? How am I supposed to understand your words, Isaiah? Well, I think there's two ways we could think about this. The first is that actions have consequences. Would you agree with that? Actions have consequences, right? And we reap what we... Right, we reap what we, so that's one way to understand these words. Actions have consequences. We reap what we sow. Another way to understand these words is that Isaiah is expressing a certain type of theological understanding that was rooted in the culture and times of his day. An understanding that we don't have to be bound to, that we can maybe go beyond or maybe head in a different direction. His theological understanding, uh, way of thinking about God, kind of is rooted in um, uh, what scholars call the Deuteronomist way of understanding. Aren't you impressed by that word? Deuteronomist. So you, know, you walk up out of the church saying, I know a fancy word, Deuteronomist. Deuteronomy, the theology of Deuteronomy is this. This is what the book of Deuteronomy is kind of teaches about God. God will give you good things if you obey if you don't obey, God will give you bad things. If you obey God, he will bless you. He will send the rain. You'll get the crops. If you disobey God, he will curse you. Okay. Anybody grow up in a church like that where they heard that message? Obey God, he'll be good to you. Disobey God, ha 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 Right? And if anybody had a problem with that, guess what? Here's my Bible to show you. It's true. It's in Deuteronomy. Well, the funny thing about the Bible is, is that the authors of the Bible oftentimes argue with themselves and disagree with themselves. I don't know if you ever saw that or picked up on that. For instance, in the book of Job, the, whoever wrote the book of Job disagreed with the way God is presented in Deuteronomy. How is God again presented in Deuteronomy? If you're good, you'll be blessed. If you're bad, you'll be cursed. All right? Are you with me? Now, if you know anything about the book of Job, whoever wrote that book said, wait a minute, I don't agree with that theology. Was Job a righteous man or an unrighteous man? He was righteous. Uh, you know anything about Job's life? What happened to him? Okay, would you call that blessing or curse? <laughs> okay. So whoever wrote the book of Job is arguing with the theology of Deuteronomy. Namely, that sometimes uh, bad things happen to good people. And so there's different ways that God uh, is understood by the biblical authors. Jesus himself said, God brings down rain on the just and the unjust. I mean, that's a clear disagreement with what the author of Deuteronomy said. The author of Deuteronomy said, God will rain, bring down the rain if you're good. He will withhold it if you're bad. So even Jesus is entering into this... Jewish debate, this biblical debate of arguing about what God is like, and Jesus is putting himself on the side of unconditional love. A way of understanding God based in unconditional love, unconditional grace, unconditional goodness. So this is a second way we can kind of understand Isaiah's words. We can kind of 
begin to think about Isaiah's words in, in light of Jesus, and given what we know about God in Christ, we could say something. Um, and before I say this, let me, let me just say this. Jesus acknowledged, when Jesus blessed people, he didn't say, here's a blessing, and if you don't respond, you're going to get cursed. But he did expect them to live in light of the blessing, okay? Hear that. When Jesus blessed people and gave them grace, he did expect them to respond to the grace that they had been given. Remember when he heals the ten lepers and only one comes back to give him thanks? Jesus says, where are the nine? Where are the nine? In other words, you are blessed. You should at least say thank you. You should at least reciprocate. Remember when he, when he uh, remember the woman caught in adultery? I love that story. Right? In John, I think it's in John 6 or John 9. And they want to stone her because she committed adultery. And Jesus advocates for her. Everyone leaves. And then he says to her, go and what? So no more. So you've been, you've been given grace and blessing. Here's, here's something that you need to live in light of the blessing. You need to live in light of the grace. Same thing with the man who was lame at the, at the pool of Bethesda. Remember there was a man who couldn't walk and Jesus healed him. But then Jesus said, go, go and show your appreciation. Go to church, he said to him. Remember? He said, go to, the, go to the temple and make the sacrifice that Moses required. In other words, you've been given blessing. You've been given grace. Live in light of it. But he doesn't say, and if you don't do this, God shall rain down fire and damnation upon you. He doesn't say that. Okay, are you with me? It's kind of, so we have to read Isaiah's words with these thoughts in the back of our mind. Lest we walk out of this church thinking, well, if I'm good, then I'll be blessed. And if I'm bad, I'll be cursed. No, 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 no. We have to see here, these pa this passage is an invitation for us to see the radical grace and goodness of God that we have been given freely, not because of anything that we have done, but because God is good, and to live in light of that. And if we don't, there will be consequences, but how I tend to think about it, how I think, tend to think about consequences, is that God doesn't attack us when we abuse his grace. We attack ourselves. That's kind of how I interpret these words. That's how I understand these words. Isaiah forgot the God who provided, or Israel forgot the God who provided grace and love and blessings. And instead they became focused on themselves. And that self-focus, that self-focus caused injustice. It caused violence and unrighteousness. This is what happens when we become self-focused. We create inner conflict in our own lives and we bring that conflict out and it manifests itself out into the lives of others. It's what happens to us, isn't it? The same thing that happened to Israel happens to us. The same song that was sung to Israel could be sung towards us. And we have to ask ourselves the question, how am I living in light of the good? How am I living in light of the grace? See, when we forget the grace of God, I believe, in our lives, when we ignore all the good that is given, and there is much good that has been given, is there not, brothers and sisters? You know, they say our happiness and our gratitude is maximized in light of, in light of two things. It has to be valuable and it has to be free. If something is free but not valuable, we won't be really grateful and flourish. You know, here's, here's a toothbrush. It's free. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Maybe from the Middle Ages, that would have been a great thing, right? Maybe have been really valuable. It's not valuable, right? If I were to give you something that was really valuable, but you had to work for it, like you get a Porsche or a nice car, a nice house, but you put your blood, sweat, and tears into it, you're not so much grateful. You're more like, I was, this was due me. I'm entitled to this. But if something is free and valuable, and the more we get in touch with the free and valuable, what is really valuable and what is free... Our gratitude goes up. Our happiness goes up. We actually receive health psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. So think about this. Have you ever thought about this? Yeah, I'm going to give you, you know, $5 billion, but, I'm gonna, but you have to give me your legs and your arms. <laughs> right? Have you ever thought about this? Would you do it? I'm going to give you a million dollars, but I'm going to take your eyesight and your hearing. We want, I want them both, right? Give me, give me both. <laughs> the things that are free and extremely valuable are the things we flourish in. 
are the things that maximize our gratitude. Think about that. Think about that. I can remember one day I woke up. This is not too long ago. This happens every now and then. I woke up and my alarm clock was, it didn't go off for some reason. So I woke up. I already was in a bad mood. I said it. I thought I said it. Okay, boom, boom. So I go into the kitchen and I'm making myself some breakfast. And all of a sudden I open up the refrigerator and the eggs aren't there. We don't have what I was really wanting, you know. Oh, I'm gonna get bad mood even more, right? And next thing you know, I mean, this was this was going on my whole morning. Have you ever had a morning like this where you're expecting something to be there and it's not there? And by the time you're getting out of the driveway, and I'm getting out of my driveway, and I'm just out in the country, and this is in Illinois. I remember this day very specifically. I'm backing out, and we live in the big main road, and I want to just get out on the road, and of course I'm looking, and of course there's traffic, and then the train's coming, right? So now I'm like, ah, oh, Murphy's Law, right? I'm just getting, now I'm, now I'm livid. I'm ah! And I'm on my way to the church office, right? You know what I'm <laughs> and then you get to the church office, and then, and then one thing after another, the whole day, right? Problem after problem after problem after problem. So at the end of the day, I was sitting in, in my chair, and I was getting ready. Everyone's in bed, and I was sitting, and I was just reflecting, and I was thinking about the entire day, and just how exhausting, how angry I was, and I was just reflecting on how I was feeling. And I realized the problem was I expected this entire day to go according to what I wanted to do. Everything that I felt anger towards was simply a result of my wanting to be in control. Had I just said, oh, okay, well, let me see what else can we, can, we can do here. I would have saved myself a whole lot of heartache. Has anyone experienced this before? Right? We've seen this. You've experienced, you've tasted this. But it's difficult to, in the moment, realize it. Especially if you've been formed by habits, right? If you've been formed by a habit, it's very difficult to let that go. But it's true nonetheless. We're wired for entitlement because of our addiction to control. Which means we set ourselves up for disappointment and loads of anxiety and anger. Because... We expect things to go our way. You know, entitled people, they tend to operate more on the basis of earning rather than receiving. If you're an entitled person, you tend to operate more on the basis of earning rather than receiving. An entitled person, when I say entitled person, I'm not just talking about someone who expects something by doing nothing. It's not what I mean. I'm talking about someone who expects something by doing something. In other words, I'm talking about the, uh, the principle of earning or the principle of works. Grace, grace has nothing to do with earning. It's the free goodness that's already given to us despite our efforts, despite what we do or what we don't do. It runs counter to all our ways of thinking about work and reward. People ask, what is the most scandalous thing about the church, the Christian church? It's not in how it treats marginalized people or not on the debates on sexuality or it's not, it's not even really a political thing. One of the most scandalous things the Christian church believes in is something called grace because it undermines our whole system that's predicated on control. Grace is the great scandal of the Christian church. The fact that we have the audacity to believe in grace. That there is a good God who has graced us and everything in the universe in which we live. Grace has nothing to do with, again, earning. But an entitled person says, I did this, so I expect that. A graceful, per a grateful person, a grace-filled person says, I received this, so I am thankful for it. But sadly and unfortunately, we prefer earning things rather than receiving them because we do not want to let go of our control. Allowing ourselves to receive means to admit something. It means to admit our lack that we don't have. Which means if we're going to admit that, we have to be what? We have to be humble. We have to be humble. This is why it's very hard to live in grace because grace requires us to say, I do not have. And who wants to say that? In a culture where everybody's walking around pretending that not only do they have, but they have it all together. 
But the power of grace is unleashed when we say, I don't have. So grace in receiving it requires humility and awareness. Some people actually get annoyed when others do good for them. Have you ever met people like this? Maybe you're one of them. Right? Some people get annoyed when someone else does good for them. Why? Because they, then they feel obligated, what? To return the favor. Do you know someone like this? Was dad like this? Was mom like this? Are you like this? Someone comes and does something good for you. They cut the lawn. You come over and the next time you go over to their house and you clean their whole house for them or something, right? You can't be obligated. I can't be under oblig... Under... I hear the language. I can't be under obligation. Whoa, whoa. You're not, under, you're not obligated, but you are under something. You're under their goodness. Can you be under goodness? Can you be a receiver? Can you be a receiver? Again, people get annoyed when others do good for them because they feel obligated to return the favor. Or if they don't feel annoyed, they still feel it's their duty to do something and the result is the same. They're robbed of the experience of grace. And when you rob yourself of the gift of letting God gift you through others, you miss out on a deeper, more satisfying dimension of human life. Now, my workers who are sitting here right now are saying, and they're, and, and they're not going to say it out loud, right? But they're saying, yeah, but Pastor Vinny, nothing's free. We got to work. You got to do. You, you can't just expect things to be handed to you now. And I agree. But how, how do we work? Are you working out of a sense of joy or are you working out of a sense of fear? Are you working out of a sense of, you know, I love my dad. My dad did a lot. My dad was one of those guys that could do everything. But he never taught me and my brother, you know. But he had to do it his way. And if it wasn't his way, it wasn't good enough, you know. And so, you know, dad did work from the sense of, if I don't do it, planet Earth will stop turning. If I don't do this, then life as we know it will end. And we laugh, right? But there are people that work out of that. And then there's people that work out of, you know what? This will get done whether or not I do it. I'm doing this because I'm having fun. I'm doing this because I've already crossed the finish line long, long ago. I am working out of a sense of abundance. You see, there's two different ways of working. Are you with me? Are you with me? We're not going to go much longer. Just stay with me. Stay with me. Remember Adam and Eve, their first day was a what day? Was it a work day? It was a Sabbath day. Okay? God didn't put Adam and Eve and say, okay now, get out there and start working. Day one. No. Adam and Eve had to work the next day. The first day was all about sit around and enjoy goodness. So that you will understand that I am a good God who is in control. And that life doesn't depend on you doing anything. And once you're able to rest in that long enough, then you can go to work. Are you with me? It's the work that springs from rest. That's why in Jewish time, it always starts with the night for the day. We're Americans. We're Westerners. We're doers, right? Do, 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 do. Suck up the time. Got to do it. Sun up. Sun down. It starts with my energy, and then I'll rest. Well, the biblical idea of grace is that you don't get in touch with it until you learn how to let it touch you. Receive. Rest. Rest. So it's not, now I'm saying don't work. I'm saying that when you do work, you're working out of a sense of grace, not a sense of law and duty. And there is a difference. You see, the great scandal of the gospel of grace is that from the moment we were conceived, we were already, we already crossed the finish line. From the moment we were, I know this is so counterintuitive. We are told to enter the rat race the moment we're born. But again, Christians are scandalous in that they believe from the moment we were conceived, the moment we were conceived, we already crossed the finish line because we were loved and graced into existence. Everything else is just a postlude to the great symphony of God's love that began playing the moment you entered the cosmos. Did you learn that growing up in school? Did you learn that from the commercial on the TV? Are you learning that driving around in this community? No, it's just the opposite. But that's the scandal and the truth of the gospel that we believe. That we've already crossed the finish line. We're already there. And now we're to live out of that sense of grace. God has planted a vineyard around you. 
God has planted a vineyard around you. He's given you life and breath and family and friends and promises and blessings. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Eternal life, hope, joy. He's given you all these things. The question is, are you living in the blessings and acknowledging them with a grateful heart? Or have you, like Isaiah's audience, forgotten all that God has provided? Have you forgotten what God has provided? If you've gotten the love song, can you no longer hear the love song? You know, one mark of a person that's forgotten and has, is not hearing is that they're constantly negative. Constantly negative. Always negative. You know anyone like this? Anybody? Constantly ne- They form the neural pathway, right? The neural pathway has been formed. Thank God for neuroplasticity. That's that insight from psychology that says just because you formed a habit doesn't mean you can unlearn a bad habit. It just requires some time and some work, right? Okay? But there's people that just form that pathway in their brain. It's very hard because everything is just negative all the time. They can't see, they can't see the grace. They can't experience the grace. Entitlement breeds negativity in complainers because for the most part, things never go our way anyway. And you can always identify someone who has forgotten grace by the fact that they lack it themselves. These are the people who you walk away from and feel depressed, right? Uninspired, your life is drained, you feel anxious, right? It leads to unrighteousness and violence and injustice. The kind that Isaiah spoke about in verse 7. So, as we close the sermon, I want you to think about our series here. Toxic religion, that's what we're calling it, right? Forgetting the gifts what toxic religion? Well, here's one part of toxic religion. A toxic religion is a, is a religion that forgets the grace of God, the promises of God, the vineyard of blessing we've been placed in. You know, one of the one of the marks of being a Methodist. I don't know if, if you have thought about this, but one of the marks of being a Methodist is, is to be a people or a person of grace. We prioritize grace. While much of Protestantism was celebrating being saved by grace, and rightly so. Early Methodists were focused on what does it mean to live by grace. That's why the people that outside of the Methodists called them, they're they're like methodical. They're, They're into methods. Why are they into methods? Why are they doing all these methods? Because Methodists said it's not just enough to be in the family of God. How do we live as a child of God? And that requires methods, how to's. And so we were known as the people of grace. For Methodists, grace is not just a a conversion experience. It's for life. So how can you begin to take advantage of the vineyard of God's grace in your life? What are you going to do when you leave? I want to give you one practice and we're done. One practice to think about or to consider. Some of you may have done this. Some of you may not have. I'm going to encourage you to experiment. If you're someone who's always getting negative, you're always thinking things should go your way, you want to break this, you want to experience the vineyard, you want to live in the blessings, but it's very... Here's a practice. Here's a habit. Here's a method. You ready? Gratitude journal. Every day, write in a journal the things that you're grateful for. Go to bed at night and just go through your entire day and write down all the things that you are grateful for. Neuroscience is saying, unless you can hold something in your mind for 10 seconds, you won't imprint it. It won't be imprinted. So you actually have to do this, and you have to think about it, and you have to hold on to it for at least 10 seconds. If it's not 10 seconds or longer, you're going to lose it. Okay? So, do a gratitude journal at the end of the day. Go through, remember that song you learned in Sunday school? Count your blessings one by one, one by one. Did you ever do that? Remember that? It's, it's, it's ancient wisdom. It's modern science. And it's good for your soul. So I want to offer that to you and consider doing that so that you can live in the vineyard. You can see the vineyard and you can live in light of it. So God, help us to live in grace. Help us to be a people who, unlike Israel of old, who discount the vineyard, discount the blessings, and turn inward and become a people of injustice and violence. Help us to be a people of justice and peace by receiving your grace, by living in your grace. We thank you for that wondrous grace. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.